Again, if we draw these circles, it's good it's not showing the clock right in there. For each of the structures that, that we know that exist in the brain, you have your thalamus, you have your midbrain, you have your pons, you have your medulla. There's medulla, pons, midbrain. You have your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrospinal cord segments. And sure enough, sensory information can come in to level the spinal cord and exit at the same side. It can cross to the other side. <coughs> All right? Because because I can I can lift this leg, I can flex this leg and extend this leg at the same time. That allows me to just immediately stand up on one leg. Now, could I have done that when I was first learning how to walk? No, nah, this stuff was imprinted on my brain because I was constantly doing it. You understand? That's the only way we learn. And of course, what we're learning is what? How to move. And that's voluntary. That's somatic motor. You got me, guys? Somatic motor. So you've got, you've, you've got this issue. You've got somatic motor. But if somatic motor is voluntary motor for skeletal muscle, then I have to account for what other muscles? What? What other muscles are there? Cardiac and smooth. Cardiac and smooth. They don't agree? Well, hey, somatic isn't going to cardiac and smooth, guys. You understand? Somatic is going to skeletal muscle for movement. Not to cardiac, not to smooth. So I have to have somatic motor for skeletal muscle movement. But the same way I have somatic motor for skeletal muscle movement, I must have visceral motor for cardiac and smooth muscle. Do you understand that, guys? Everybody follow? The sensory system is still sensory. It's still pulling information back into the spinal cord. Everybody understand? And if it's pulling from the body, that's what the spinal nerve's job's at. It's pulling from organs. Well, um, I mean, you can get some visceral organ reflection, but normally, I mean, it, 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 sim so what happens is when you, when you talk about visceral motor, so mis visceral motor gets broken down into two types. Well, one that has a positive effect and one that has a negative effect. You follow? At least in most cases. So one that raises the heart rate and one that lowers the heart rate. Does that make sense, guys? One that increases the respiratory rate, one that lowers the respiratory rate. Everyone agree? Sure. So, so my visceral motor must have this breakdown of what's sympathetic from what's parasympathetic. And these sympathetic versus parasympathetic fibers, guys, they're piggybacking on spinal nerves. Did everybody hear me? They're piggybacking on cranial nerves. Did everybody hear me? The parasympathetic and sympathetics are going to piggyback on spinal nerves and cranial nerves. They're going to do what everybody else wants to do, but they're doing it to visceral instead of skeletal. Everybody understand? Said cranial. Cranial and spinal nerves. Okay. So all right. So there, I I, I gave it to you. Ready? Now watch. Watch. It's in the name, guys. It's not, this is not that hard. You know why it's hard? Because it was hard for me, you know why? Because my professor sucked at explaining it. He basically like went over it, and then we had to read it in the book. Well, that's not how I learned it. What I did is I drew it out, just like you see me doing right here. And it's complex, I'm not gonna lie to you. And sure enough, the parasympathetic nervous system is referred to as the cranio Sacral division. And sympathetic is known as the thoraco lumbar division. Now, why would you why do you think they would call the sympathetic nervous system the thoraco lumbar division? Because why? Because see right here? See that structure, that H within the H that I told you we would label in a moment? That structure is referred to as the lateral 
gray horn. Well, you find that lateral gray horn in thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. But in thoracic and lumbar, the, the neurons that are there, their cell bodies will exit, come out, piggyback on spinal nerve, and then exit to go to viscera, which is heart, lung, GI, kidney, liver, you name it, it is there. You understand? That's at the level of thoracic and lumbar. That's why they call the sympathetic nervous system the thoracic lumbar, because the motor neurons coming initially from the spinal cord, their axons will extend out. And instead of going out to skeletal muscle, they're going to turn inward to cardiac and smooth muscle for the purpose of what? Increasing heart rate, increasing respiratory rate, right? Everyone agree? And what? Increasing blood pressure, BP. Increased contractility of the heart, too. That means the force of contraction of the heart. How forcefully it contracts. It'll increase venous return. So it'll get it'll get more blood back to the heart. Through squeezing veins and arteries, you get you get blood in the arteries gets there quicker because the pressure goes higher. That's what we want. We don't care about the volume, we care about how quickly it gets there. Why do I why do I care about how quickly my blood on the arterial side gets to its organ, guys? Why do I care so much how quickly it gets there, not how much gets there? So, so the cells don't die. What's blood carrying? Oxygen. Well, it's carrying red blood cells. The red blood cells have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has iron in it. Iron carries the oxygen. That's next semester. <laughs> and, 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 and so that's why the sympathetic nervous system does all what it does. You understand, guys? And so sure enough now, everybody ready? The reason why we give it the name that everyone knows it as is because it's green for go. It's fight or flight. Fight or flight. And I can tell you I've never been one to back away from a fight. That was one of my biggest problems. <laughs> Too hot here. Not good. All right. Now, guys, if, if, so I told you now, parasympathetic is craniosacral. Well, what's coming out of the cranium that's going to go to organs? What cranial nerves are going to go to organs, guys, not skeletal muscle? Three, seven, nine, Three, seven, nine ten. <laughs> cranial nerves. Three, Cranial nerve, seven. Cranial nerve, nine. And cranial nerve, 10 are gonna go, 10 is gonna be, uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a, so I'm gonna put a huge star next to 10, because 10, the Vegas, is the biggest player in all of this, guys. The Vegas does larynx, trachea, the lungs, the esophagus, the heart, this is all the stuff it innervates. The stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the cecum, the ascending colon, and the transverse colon. The vagus nerve stops right here. It stops right here. Right at the end of the, the, the second part of the large intestine. So it does all the small intestine and two thirds of the large intestine, along with all the other digestive organs above, and heart, and blood vessels. Okay, so vagus is huge. It's a huge component to this. You guys remember when I talked about the intrinsic muscles of the eye? Remember the intrinsic, not the extrinsic muscles of the eye, the six extrinsic muscles of the eye, but there were three intrinsic muscles to the eye. Of those three, one of them is innervated by sympathetic nerves. The other two are innervated by cranial, by 
fibers that are being piggybacked through cranial nerve number three up to the eyeball. So what did I tell you? Parasympathetic fibers and sympathetic fibers are going to piggyback on spinal nerves until they, until they can. And then when need be, it can come off if they have to. The sympathetics will do it. They ha they'll have to. They'll have to. The parasympathetics, they're smart. They don't have to. They're piggybacking on cranial nerves that are already running to structures in the eye, structures in the... Because, guys, look, if I'm rest and digest, already cranial sacral is these cranial nerves, majority of it's vagus again, because this does eye, and these two do the back of the throat, right? The tongue and the back of the throat, uh, the, or the oral cavity and the back of the throat, right? Along with taste and stuff like whatnot. But notice what I said. It's craniosacral division. You see that? So sure enough, when I go to draw my sacral division, when I go to, go to draw my sacral spinal cord segments, I'm going to have these little itty bitty lateral gray horns. And you know what? I didn't know this until I looked this up like two semesters ago. Because I was like, man, you know what? Where, where, where are those sacral fibers coming from? Where are they coming from? Except, I know they're coming from down that way, but where are they originating from? So I look it up. I was like, what? Sacral's got lateral gray horns too? Yeah, but they're not the same. Notice how I use a lighter color? They're not the same lateral gray horn because these neurons, what they're going to release, so for them to go to viscera, for them to go to viscera, they're going to have to do it through a, a, a second neuron, like that. For these guys, it's different. They're going to come out, piggyback on spinal nerves. They're going to come out from the same area, piggyback on spinal nerves, come out go to organ, but sure enough, they'll go out to the organ, and within the wall of the organ, they'll find their second neuron. And sure enough, what organs are we talking about? For sacral? Oh, well, that's whatever's left of the GI. Descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum. That's what sacral's doing. So I think it's S1 through S... S1, so S1, spinal... Uh, S1 through S3 uh, sacral spinal cord segments will have lateral gray horns. These little lateral gray horns that have these neurons that come out. And what they're going to do is they're going to go, they're not going to go out to create ganglia like sympathetics do. Sympathetics are going to have this like special ganglia that they're going to create. All kinds of ganglia. Ganglia along the vertebral column, they call them paravertebral ganglia. Ganglia that are in front of the column, they call them prevertebral ganglia. Ganglia that are up here in the neck, because because they're these fibers, guys, they're going out to organs. If they gotta get up to neck, then they gotta go up to neck. You understand? The way that they do that is <clears throat> the fibers they'll come up to the neck. So they'll come up into the region of the neck, and then they'll they'll find a secondary neuron that'll go out to the to the skull. And these ganglia, they call them um, cervical ganglia. So I'll write it in dark blue here. Or, yeah, dark blue. So these fibers from thoracic lumbar, which are involved in sympathetic nervous system, they have two neuronal system, and that two neuronal system typically will come into this ganglia and have a second neuron that'll come out to the viscera. In the case that it wants to go out to the neck, those fibers will carry up to the area of the neck, or to what they refer to as the cervical region, where there are, the cervical region, there are these cervical ganglia, and in those cervical ganglia, you'll have secondary neurons that will extend out to go to the head. To the eye for that that one smooth smooth muscle right that or the smooth muscle group that does the dilation of the pupil right everyone agree because when I'm in fight-or-flight response when I'm in fight-or-flight response another thing that happens is what my pupil dilates yeah 
And what the purpose of that is to allow more light to come in so your peripheral view is more open. Right? So that way you can kind of see more in case of like peripheral attack, yeah? You know what I mean? Like I see more than one person coming at me, right? So that's, that's the idea. So you get an increase in heart rate, an increase in respiratory rate, an increase in blood pressure. You're also going to get an increase in the, in the pupillary and dilation. So you're going to get this thing called pup pupillary, pupillary dilation. And this is green for go, guys. This is green for go. You're in fight or flight response. So are you ready to run or you're ready to fight, okay? And this is stress, this is high stress, guys. Would I need more oxygen and glucose there? Absolutely. You see why I have an increase in heart rate, an increase in respiratory rate? You see why I have an increase in insulin and glucagon? I'm mobilizing glucose stores, guys. I'm getting them to the skeletal muscle. I need to feed the skeletal muscle. I'm in a fight or flight response, man. And, and that's why people like people say, yo, don't call me a hero, right? Because at the moment when you're trained to do something, you don't think about the, you don't, you would not think about it. If you're trained to do something, you don't, you don't think about the possible damage or danger that you could do to yourself by going into a situation to help others. You just go in, right? Because that's what you're trained to do. And, and I understand when people say like, yeah, they don't want to be called healers because they're just doing their job, right? But they're putting their lives on the line to do that, right? So they're training themselves to be in a fight or flight response regularly so that when they're in the true fight or flight response, it does not affect them psychologically, guys. Do you understand? And isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about the brain, right? And all the stuff that can impact it, yeah? yeah. <clears throat> so, parasympathetic cranial sacral division. Who makes it up? Cranium and sacrum. Which which part of the cranium? Cranial nerve number three, cranial nerve number seven, cranial nerve number nine, and cranial nerve number ten. Understand? Three does pupillary constriction and the accommodation response for for the approximation of type set. So when something gets closer to you, right, you have the ability of taking your lens and making it thinner or fatter, right? And so if you, if you relax it, you make it fatter, then you can take the image and fall into the retina as it gets closer. If you cannot respond in that way, which is what's going on with me, then you gotta be constantly doing this and then this. <laughs> or get bifocals. It sucks. So, because my accommodation response is being little by little, man, my brain's shutting down. You follow? This is, this is a half a million dollar brain right here, right? And it's shutting down. Little by little, it's shutting down. Each process is shutting down. Right? I won't be here forever. Everything is shutting down. So, we only have so much time with this. All right, to take advantage of it. That's the idea. So you have sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic, historical, lumbar. Why? Oh, because the because the neurons that give rise to the thoracal, the, the original neurons, the first neurons, the preganglionic neurons. Did everybody hear me? I'm going to label it. This neuron right there, it's called a A pre-ganglionic neuron. Even if it's coming here or it's stopping there. See that? Everybody see that? Then this guy and this guy would be examples of post-ganglionic neurons. Everybody see that? Everybody, everybody understand that? But wait, now let's go to sacral. Well, wait, didn't I say that sacral has a, what would we call that? A pre or post? Where's the second one? Didn't I tell you? Second one is in the wall 
of organ. So the post ganglionic neuron situated in the wall of the organ. Everybody see that? The preganglionic, there's the preganglionic. Now guys, does everyone agree I can't have one preganglionic neuron for sympathetic? I can't have one preganglionic for parasympathetic. You agree? I gotta have a shit ton. You agree? Hey, if I wanna be efficient, can I be efficient with one? No. Nah. Can I be efficient with a pair? No. Nah. I gotta have a shit ton. You ready to follow? Guys, does it make sense? You, you need this stuff. I, I, do I not need to go into fight or flight response? My dog, he went into fight or flight response today, boy. His heart was jumping out of his chest. I'm recording this. My neighbor doesn't know. So his neighbor, three doors down, pompous as hell, is always sitting on his porch to say good morning to him, say good evening to him, doesn't say shit to me. I'm gonna, I want to throw shit at him is what I want to throw at him. Well, by the way, Dan, sure enough, his wife is one lazy mofo. She lets her dog out, doesn't walk the dog. He does the same, but at least he goes outside and sits out there. She leaves the dog out. The dog's a female. Schnauzer, super cute. Well, I didn't know, she's got a crush on my dog. And she was teasing my dog. And she's in heat. And her owner's not watching her. And my buddy, hey, my buddy, he needs to have a smile on his face. <laughs> so I just turned the other way and pretend like I didn't see nothing. Bonacito, <laughs> he had no clue what the hell he was doing. He's not my dog. It's not my dog. Because my dog seriously would know what to do. <laughs> So I was like, I was just sitting there like, yeah, wow, buddy, yeah, man, we got to get you some, we got to get you some lessons. <laughs> All right. So he was in a fight or flight response. Every creature goes through a fight or flight response. Every creature has a primitive brain. Sure enough, the primitive brain is what controls autonomic systems. Did you hear me? Primitive brain controls autonomic systems. That means hypothalamus, mammillary bodies, epithalamus, diencephalon, and amygdala, all the primitive structures scattered throughout the base of the skull, right? Scattered throughout the base of the brain that's sitting on the skull, the base of the skull, right? Those structures, guys, are dictating autonomic functions. You got me? That means what? That wiring must be coming from above, down, specifically to connect to this preganglionic that's here in the spinal cord, or the preganglionic here that's in the spinal cord. Guys, do you understand that? That's the reason why we have the spinal cord connected. That's why each spinal cord has its individual neurons for reflexes, but yet has these tracks that are bringing information down and then dropping the connections off into the gray matter so that neurons can associate and integrate this information that it's getting from brain and with what it's getting at at the level of each spinal cord segment. Do you understand that guys? So at each level of spinal cord segment, we got reflexes coming in and out, don't we? Yeah, here, I'll draw it for you. Well, there's my pseudo unipolar neuron coming in and there's my motor neuron going out. Sure enough, this structure right here, that's called the anterior gray form. And this structure where the pseudo unipolar sensory neuron, so this is your sensory neuron, this is your motor neuron. It's the basic reflex arc. He's going, the sensory neuron is going into the posterior gray form. Okay? And then remember, we were talking about this. We talked about this the other day. We said, so, well, sensory information gets broken down basically into two types. Only two I'm going to hold you responsible for. 
One of them is called the dorsal column medial and meniscal pathway, and the other one's called the spinal thalamic pathway. And those are the only two pathways you need to know. The dorsal column medial and meniscal pathway, the DCML, you look it up in your book, know it. And your spinal thalamic. But why, Professor P? Ah, because the DCML, they decusate. at medulla. That means they crisscross from one side to the other at the medulla. 80% of spinal thalamus crisscross at the level of the spinal cord. 20% go up crisscross at the level of the medulla. That's the difference between the lateral spinal thalamics versus the anterior spinal thalamic tracts. That's why I told you spinal thalamics, there's an anterior and a posterior. There's an 80 and a 20. A breakdown. Notice the column. It's all this right here. This right here, guys, is your dorsal column, also known as posterior column. Posterior white column. Because it's white matter. Remember we said white matter's on the outside, gray matter's on the inside. Yeah? So, all right, so let's review. Let's review. Spinal cord, made up of multiple segments, right? You've got, we've got 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And we know that spinal nerves have to have a shit ton of neurons. And they have, and we know that all spinal nerves are mixed. Does everyone agree? Not one of the spinal nerves is just motor. You got sensory and motor, and the sensory is coming in to the posterior part of the spinal cord, and the motor coming the motor originates in spinal cord. Remember, I told you all sensory neurons, guys, are coming from these neural crest cells. Remember? And if you don't know what neural crest cells are, guess what? Go to the back of the book. Use your book as a reference. Go to the back of the book in pregnancy, right? It's chapter 28. And if you go in the back of the book, sure enough, they'll show you the, the, how, how you create the neural tube. If you look in, there's, it's there. It's called neuralation. The process of creating a neural tube is referred to as neuralation. And you, all you're doing is folding. You're, you're folding a fabric, a fabric of cells. You're folding it to create a tube. The cells that direct and aid in the closure of that tube, those cells, they're called neural crest cells. Those neural crest cells give rise to all of the sensory neurons of the entire human body. This is why we are sensory creatures, is because of these neural crest cells. They give rise to all sensory neurons of the entire human body. You know what else they give rise to, guys? What else would they give rise to in my picture? What do you think? So all the sensory neurons, they're from neural crest. What about these guys that are out here and not associated with having their cell bodies in the spinal? What about this postganglionic here? What about that postganglionic there? What about this postganglionic there? What do you think, guys? Also neural crest? Everybody look at me. Yes. These neural crust cells are that important. You see? These neural crust cells are so important that not only do they make neural not only can they make neurons of the neurons to help create create postganglionic, so they can make postganglionic neurons for the parasympathetics, they can also they also make the postganglionic neurons for the sympathetics. So hold up, man, you're telling me that one cell does all this shit? Yeah, that's how powerful the cell is. <laughs> and sure enough, guys, if I'm talking about these cells, then obviously I have to talk about them. Why? Because they're different. Yes, sure enough, they're not all that different. Um, now I'm going to draw you a bow. How, how I'm going to compare for you how they really are the same. And in this case, I like to use blue. Uh, I like to use. I like to use green and red for go and stop. So what happens? In sympathetic, you have a, 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 a preganglionic and a postganglionic. And in parasymp, you have the same. You have a postganglionic, I mean a preganglionic, and a postganglionic. Already follow? Now, here's the thing. 
if I were to if I were to really draw these, then I would have to say, well, if, if I wanted to be more thorough, I would have to do this now. I would have to identify. So all right. So my parasympathetic has a preganglionic, a preganglionic, all right, and my parasympathetic and a preganglionic and my sympathetic. They both have preganglionics. They both have postganglionics. The preganglionic neurons are sympathetics, and the preganglionic neurons are parasympathetics. They do not come from neural crest cells, guys. Because their cell bodies reside within the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord or of the nuclei in the brainstem, because we're talking about cranial, right? We're talking about cranial, right? Fibers. These are coming from brainstem, the nuclei within the brainstem. Then these guys, these guys, their cell bodies are sitting either in brain or spinal cord, and these are sitting in spinal cord. You got me? So they are not neural crest cells, but these are. Okay? So sure enough, these both secrete acetylcholine at their terminals. Did everybody hear me? So this guy will secrete acetylcholine, it'll go to the cell bodies, the dendrites and the cell bodies of this secondary neuron, what they call post postganglion neuron. Okay? And guys, this synapse resides within some ganglion. Remember the definition of ganglia is cell bodies, an accumulation of cell bodies outside the CNS. I know. That's why I don't use basal ganglia, and your book does. Your book is wrong in using the word basal ganglia to describe the deep motor nuclei that I, you see why I don't use basal ganglia? Why don't I use basal ganglia to describe the deep motor nuclei, guys? Because the moment I use the word ganglia, it confuses you, right? Because the word ganglia should only be used when you're referring to cell bodies that are an accumulation outside of the CNS. But yet we're called, this, the book is calling them basal ganglia. Instead of the calling them deep brain nuclei or deep brain motor nuclei. Call them what they are. Don't use the word basal ganglia and then confuse people. Because they're not ganglia, they're nuclei within the brain. You got me? They're the aggregation of cell bodies of neurons within the brain. And by definition, that is nuclei. So, parasympathetics have ganglia. Sure enough, the sympathetics, guys, they also have ganglia. And sure enough, their preganglionics also secrete acetylcholine. So then how are they different? How is one fight or flight and the other one rest and digest, guys? Here, I didn't write it on here. Rest. Oh, sorry, I'll write it in red. Rest and digest. So this is rest and digest. And that means we're gonna lower heart rate, we're gonna lower respiratory rate, we're gonna lower blood pressure. All right, we're gonna cause pupillary, pupillary constriction. Right. So how are they different then? If they're having opposite physiological effects on certain organs, guys, then there has to be a difference. Does everyone agree? Yes? Yeah. So where the difference truly lies is that this guy produces acetylcholine. And this guy produces norepinephrine or epinephrine. So it's not the preganglionics that are really any different, it's the what? The postganglionics that are different. You see that, guys? And then what did I tell you? The postganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system tend to do what? Be in the wall. So their ganglia are in the wall of organs. Everybody see that? Now you see why you can't get 
into 2086 unless you finish 2085. Because when I start talking about aganglionic megacolon in GI, listen to the word. What does A mean, guys, in, any, in front of any word? Without. Without. So aganglionic, what is that telling you? Um, no ganglia. Megacolon. What's that telling you? Big colon. Big colon, why? Because no ganglia. No ganglia, no input. No input, no smooth muscle contraction. Big colon. See that? A ganglionic megacolon. Now, you don't know that. You don't learn this now. When you go and I teach you A ganglionic megacolon, you're going to go crazy. Sure enough, that's the look that I get when students don't take me for 25 and then come take me for 2086. Right? They'll be like, oh, I didn't learn that. You didn't learn this? Because it's in the book. And it's in the homework. Not everybody uses the book. Not everybody uses the homework. <laughs> you talk to a lot of your cohorts. They're paying for a book. They don't even know that the homework is free. They're tossing that little card away at the end. They don't even know it. Because the professors aren't even using it. That's not fair. If I'm going to make you pay for the book, I'm going to sign homework. All right. Any questions so far, guys? <coughs> and again, who's in charge of these guys? Well, remember, up here, where, where is cranial nerve 3 coming? Where does cranial nerve come out of? Midbrain or pons? Three. Right between midbrain and pons. 3 and 4. I, I would expect you to know that. All right. So right here is cranial nerve 3 and cranial nerve 4. Right there at the junction between midbrain and pons. Four comes from the backside, sneaks around laterally. Comes from the, it's nuclear posterior.